so exciting. So happy to have you on my YouTube channel. It's very exciting. Okay. Pleasure. Let me introduce you to um, my viewers that I'm so happy and honored to have Daniel A. Nigro on my podcast, our former FDNY, which we love, commissioner of New York City. So, you know, with that, I just, you know, I feel like, you know, I don't know how many people know your backstory. I don't actually know it myself. So I, I didn't even want to read about you because I wanted you to kind of tell me as well. And I'd be surprised to see, you know, where did you grow up? You know, where did you go to school? Um, so that people kind of see who you are and where you came from to become this uh, NY, FDNY uh, commissioner. And, uh, you know, a little bit about the backstory of your 53 years prior to that. Well, yeah, I've been around a long time, so it's a long story. Uh, uh, I lived in Bayside, and now I live a few blocks away. It's technically Whitestone, but the same old neighborhood I grew up in. Uh, my wife grew up here also. Went to local public schools and Bayside High School. Um, stayed in New York, went to Baruch College, and just before I was about to graduate in uh, 1969, was when I was called to the fire department. So that started 53 years ago. Wow. I was able to finish college while I was uh, a young firefighter working in Manhattan and going to school in Manhattan and getting that over with. And uh, I was. Now, now the question is, what made you want to become a fireman? Well, like many other people in the department, my father was in the department. So soon after he came back from the Pacific in the 1940s, uh, he was called to the fire department and he was a, a captain when he retired in 1977. And he was very happy with the fire department. Uh, originally, I was going to school thinking I was going to uh, going to Baruch and learn about finance and work on Wall Street. And um, my father said, take the test anyway. And see what happens and as as i got called i said well i'll give it a try and uh, the rest is history 53 years later that's it, that's crazy that's like the same thing with uh, my husband the same way he's fdny as obviously and he also was thinking he's gonna go in for finance did the same exact thing you just stated oh because he had no history of fdny in his family he just except for his actually let me take that back. His uncle Joe actually was at FDNY. And so he decided, oh, I'll just take the test, see what happens. And then the rest is history here. He's um, almost 21 years plus. So it's the same story. I think once you get into the FDNY, I can see why all of you stay, the, the sisterhood, brotherhood of all the men there and the camaraderie and how, you know, the, the service that you guys do and then and the women are doing now as well, because we have, I know, 13 new, um, FDNY women, which is which is really nice. And would you have, since we're on this topic, do you have any advice for them? Since we just graduated thirteen new FDNY women, which is pretty impressive. Well, certainly, uh, I lived through the early days when women first entered the department in 1982, and remembered how terribly difficult it was for them. Um, even people marched around in front of the firehouses saying, uh, firefighters are going to die. Um, you know, women can't do the job. And, and many of these women were uh, faced terrible hazing and uh, not being accepted in the firehouse. Well, thankfully that has all changed uh, in the last 40 years. So I think the women coming into our department today are welcomed. Um, I say all the time, there are thousands of women in our city that can do the job. It's a very difficult physical job. Um, many men can't do it. Many women can't do it. But there are many that can. And we hope more and more are encouraged to join the department and join what we like to call the greatest job on earth. Well, I, I agree with you in that. I think, you know, even though I think we should now go back and talk about 9-11 that day and how it affected you and you know, the FDNY and all our, all that we, all those we lost that day. And, you know, take us back to that morning and what, what happened for you and personally that day, because I know you were very involved. Well, how, you know, it's still, for all of us that were there, um, uh, it sticks in every day. We think about something that 
happened that day. So that started as a routine day at headquarters. I was chief of operations then, which is the second high ranking uniform person in the department. And my dear friend, Pete Gancy was chief of department. So there I was in Pete's office starting the morning uh, as we usually did with coffee and conversation. Um, and suddenly the building shook and we heard a, uh, an explosion. This was all the way from Brooklyn. Looked out, we could see the World Trade Center from, from the office. And uh, there it was, fire and out of the upper floors uh, of the North Tower. So we immediately rushed downstairs, jumped in Pete's car and went over the Brooklyn Bridge and looking up at the building, I said to him that, that, that before we got there, this will be the worst day of our lives. And uh, little did I know how bad it was going to be. Uh, it was uh, the amount of fire. You, you knew that people were, you know, many people were already dead and uh, we wouldn't be able to put out that fire, but we would try to rescue as many people as we could. And yeah, it was, uh, we all know how that felt that day. And it's very hard still uh, knowing 20 years later how it still affects us and losing my husband Michael was really difficult for me and I know the only solace I have is that world class memorial museum that we have today that I can go and actually be there and reflect and feel his energy and his, you know since I have no remains so I know how that feels I know we're going to honor um, first responders who have actually passed and are still sick at the glade uh, May 30th this year so which is nice that we can actually do that because we're past this pandemic, which is good. Hopefully, God willing, nothing comes back um, and we stay open. But after losing 343 FDNY and three retiree FDNY, I mean, we understand the loss and the pain. And now we've actually lost more first responders than we've lost loved ones. So that's a really sad story in its own right. And people are still sick and dying. All those who came and did the right thing and you know, I always pray for them, um, thinking about that and now turning into, you know, what's going on in the world. What do you think about, you know, we kind of that was our 9-11 was our war. What do you think about what's going on in Ukraine right now and the suffrage and the pain and suffering that all them, all that all the women and children and the men are doing right now? And, you know, kind of it ties into the war we had here in a different way. I'm going to get your thoughts it was, on it. Somewhat unimaginable. You know, I, you look at what's going on and you see the ground war and it's reminiscent of, you know, World War II. Like no one expected tanks to be rolling into a country in Europe and, and uh, air, missile strikes and uh, air strikes. It's just awful. I don't know what they say, 4,000 people, 4 million people have left Ukraine already. Yeah. Um, 8 million people have been displaced just the, the horror of people doing that to other people. When will it end? It's, it's so discouraging when we think that these, these things will stop and um, they, just, they just keep going. And where it will lead is, is a difficult thing to even think of, of uh, what could possibly be the end game here. <clears throat> yes, I agree. It's, it's very disturbing. I feel, you know, I know you have grandchildren. I know you have children. I feel, you know, I mean, they're older, but you have little ones too. And I feel it's very difficult for me as having two girls that are 14 and 16 to navigate this world. You know, we've had, we have a war going on. We have the pandemic. We have, you know, mental illness that's rampant. We have people committing suicide on a regular basis, which is so wrong on every level. And I'm, you know, very disturbed by that alone. And also people are, you know, I'm hoping that <clears throat> people understand that this, you know, their future, you know, we are I'm worried about them. Like, how are they going to navigate this? You know, we have climate change. We have so many things that, you know, we, you, we were around the block, you were around a little longer than I have been, but I feel like we've, what is going on? Like, how are we going to have them navigate this next phase and the, you know, the future? And it's hard. I feel, you know, I pray a lot to God. I'm a, Big faith person as you see the pope behind me and that was a big deal when he went to the memorial in 2015 and 
you know, my girls were there. And I think, you know, faith is important. God is important at this point. I think we just got to keep praying, you know, because you have little, how old are your grandkids now? I have grandkids from uh, seven to 17. And uh, I, I think, you know, as bad as it is, I think people have always worried about the future, about their children, their grandchildren. You think about, I mentioned World War II. Imagine the, you know, the devastation in Europe that went then and people must have felt there was no future. There'd be no future for their children, for their grandchildren. And yet there is. So we have to be confident. We have to, as you say, pray. And the power of prayer is strong. Uh, it, it keeps us strong. It helped. It certainly helped me after 9-11. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to Rome shortly after 9-11 and have an audience with uh, John Paul II. And, and that was a turning point, really, uh, for me, of uh, encouragement to to go on and be strong. So uh, you're doing all the right things, and a lot of people are doing the right thing. And we just have to be hopeful that uh, um, people will come to the senses over there and, and, and stop this terrible war. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think, you know, someone like you is, is helpful speaking because you've been here so long and you your service was 53 years, which is phenomenal. And, you know, thinking about that, I mean, how what are you going to do now? Like, what is your plan? Because, you know, you've dedicated almost your all your almost all your life, except for a quarter of it to to service and doing positive things and really helping, you know, navigate uh, the FDNY to where they are now. And, you know, um, how do you feel about, do you still help them? Like, cause with, I see there was a lot of mandates with the vaccines and I know my husband had to work over, over, over time because they had 20% um, who didn't want to take the vaccine. So did you kind of get involved in that in any capacity to, to help, you know, figure out what's going on and seeing, them through that, even though you're retired now, do you kind of still, you know, consult or help them in any way? Well, in the early stages of the mandate, I mean, it was a citywide mandate. So the fire department was um, just mandated as every other agency in the city uh, to, to go along with it. And like you say, some of our members uh, did not want to get vaccinated. They're still unvaccinated. But now that I'm retired, uh, the responsibility falls on uh, Laura Cavanaugh, who's acting commissioner and our new mayor, and we'll see where that leads us. As far as I was retired before, in, in 2002, I retired as chief of department, and I, I had a very long, uh, what do you call it, a vacation, an exile, or, or uh, anything else until 2014. Hmm. Wow. I, I'm consulting. I did some public speaking, and maybe I'll do some of that again. I'm, I am trying to write a book, which... Uh, oh, great. Uh, We'll see how that goes, but uh, I'll, I'm determined to get that done. But you're a great speaker. I was at the Rotary Club when you spoke. Very impressive. So I'm glad you're still doing those kinds of things. I feel like that's important. I think people need to hear your story and see your work and your career and your service to us. And your knowledge is powerful, I think. You know, I think that's important, too, because we need to, you know, we need you. You're like words of wisdom you're helping us navigate because you, you you've been around for a while and you're still strong and you're still doing it so that's good you should work on your book I think it'd be fascinating to do that and you know what do you think about the um you know it's ironic as Kavanaugh my stepfather was a Kavanaugh with a K and it's rare for, for K's instead of C's so um I'm sure she's what do we think about the intermittent one and do you have any idea of who might be the future commissioner for updating well Laura has been with the department for eight years, civilian city. Um, when Bob Turner, who was first deputy when I first became commissioner, retired, I appointed Laura because I, I knew she was uh, dedicated, hardworking, intelligent. Um, she has all the tools to be a good commissioner. Mm, okay. Whether the mayor selects her or not, um, I have no input in that, but I would, uh, I would think it would be great she'd be the first and she is the first right now I tell her you're the commissioner you know acting in your title whatever but the department needs a commissioner and and since February 16th she's been doing the job so um and she's been doing it very well oh, that's great I'm happy to hear that we can root for her that's good I'm hoping that could happen for her and she could be the first woman commissioner for the FDNY which is kind of exciting so 
that'd be good. I mean, I don't, I haven't heard anything about who would, I mean, when would they decide that? Is that something that there's a, is there a time frame for that or is there not a time frame for that? Like to decide who would do it? I mean, in general, you know, when I go back to Mayor Lindsay and, and uh, the mayor would appoint a fire commissioner as soon as they went into office in January. Oh. But mayor de blasio held off i wasn't named until may uh and he was inaugurated of course on new year's so um maybe they started a trend that the uh, mayors take their no time. rush <laughs> take your time which is good actually you know mayor de blasio had told me that the, he felt the department was very stable which it is and he was working with other uh city agencies first and not that it was less important, but it was one of the most stable city agencies. And I think that remains uh, the case. No, I agree with you. I think so as well. And I think that's a testament to your work and your dedication to it. So just give yourself some credit. 53 years is a long time to be involved in any organization, agency, anything. So when you climbed your way up and now you're able to get a little break and have, you know, work on some things like motivation speaking and books. And I think that your book would be important. So that's great. I'm so happy. I'm like honored for you to be here. It's just amazing just to be able to talk to you finally. And one on one, as you usually have been running around or something. And that's nice. I'm happy. Hope, hope your house stuff is coming along. I know you were working on your roof and things. Oh, yeah. We, uh, is that done I now? I put off a lot of things over the past eight years, and uh, there were a lot of things on my list of uh, fix this and fix that. So we're we're moving along with that. And my wife and I celebrated our 50th anniversary in September. Wow, uh, nice. Congrat September what? September 25th. Oh, very nice. Congratulations. That's really we're nice. Finally taking our 50th anniversary trip uh, in May. Uh, oh, yeah. Nice. Where are you going? Going back to Italy and uh, spending two visiting friends in Tuscany and in Venice. That's exciting. Yeah, I'm, I love Italy. I was in Rome too. I think I was in Rome probably at the same time you were there. I was in 2003 because we saw, well, we actually saw the Pope's last, um, the messaging in the window, like when he came out in the window at the square. I think that was his last messaging, but we, we got to see him there. So it was really an honor as well as meeting Pope Francis physically in person so so faith is important i'm glad you're able to get away you know happy anniversary congratulations again for your 53 years of service you look great you're you're like a rock star on my book and um i want to just thank you and that's i think that's good i think we've covered everything and i'm looking forward to sharing this with our viewers and and if anything else comes up you will know how i know how to find you <laughs> so it's always to you monica and um good luck to you yes thank you i appreciate that yeah having me on yes thank you pleasure bye bye i always blow kisses at the end of my meetings because it's important to share love and light all right have a good rest of the day pleasure and take care of yourself you too thank, thank you, you. Bye bye.